So in terms of our talk today, um, I'd like to talk to you about risk factors and epidemiology of hepatocellular carcinoma. I'll also be um, interchanging the term HCC as the abbreviation for that. We'll also talk about surveillance or screening for HCC. So how do we know, um, how do we diagnose this? Uh, we'll talk about how to make the diagnosis as well as how to stage the cancer. And then we'll talk about treatment decisions. We often do this in a multidisciplinary setting. Now, this isn't the only kind of liver cancer. Uh, it's just the most common, um, and that's why we've chosen to focus on this particular type of uh, uh, liver cancer today. Um, there's also cancers of the bile duct called cholangiocarcinoma. Um, we're not going to get into that today. There's also uh, cancers that can metastasize to the liver. Um, but we're also not uh, planning on talking that, about that either. But, um, but by far and away, the most uh, common primary liver cancer is hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, HCC is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths um, and the fifth most common cancer worldwide. In Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, two areas where it's uh, quite common, um, there's over half a million new HCC cases that develop every year. Unfortunately, also in the West, the incidence of HCC is also rising, though not nearly as high or uh, fast as it used to be. Um, a lot of our efforts in terms of curing, trying to cure hepatitis C have directly led to decreasing rates of, hep of HCC. And then importantly for this talk, when we think about who is at risk for liver cancer, most cases are associated with an underlying risk factor. And we're going to go through those. So here's a, a slide kind of talking more about uh, the diagnosis of HCC. Um, and these are age-adjusted rates and trends over the last 15 years. And what you can see is that we had, at first were having quite an increase in the diagnosis. But over the last few years, we started to see a leveling off of that rise. The prognosis for HCC used to be extremely poor. Uh, with you know, the median survival or the survival of about half uh, the uh, patients only being about a year from the time of diagnosis of liver cancer. But now with better and better treatments, we're starting to see patients live longer and longer, and often we're seeing patients who are able to be cured of this uh, cancer. So when we think about who's at risk for liver cancer, uh, before we go into these uh, specifics, I do want to say that the vast majority of people who get a liver cancer are male. About three-quarters to four-fifths of patients are male. And they're typically in their 60s to 70s. It's pretty rare, actually, to get liver cancer before the age of uh, 50. Uh, and again, we're speaking mostly about HCC. But as I mentioned, most cases of liver cancer have an underlying uh, cause of chronic liver disease. So as you heard about last week, I th you guys heard about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, that's here called fatty liver. Hepatitis C you may know of, that's a chronic viral infection, a common cause of cirrhosis or end-stage fibrosis or scarring of the liver. Alcohol is a common cause of chronic liver disease. There are several different types of metabolic or inherited or genetic causes of liver disease. These are a little bit less common. And then hepatitis B is another viral infection that's quite common in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So if we were to put circles around the two, patients, two types of patients who would get eight liver cancer, they would be patients with hepatitis B and patients with cirrhosis. So if, when, I, when I teach you know, my medical students, my residents, my fellows, those are the two groups of people we keep in mind. Okay? It's not like those are the only two patients who, uh, types of patients who get liver cancer, but far and away those are the two most common either patients who have chronic hepatitis B infection or patients who have end-stage scarring from chronic disease that has developed into cirrhosis. Now, those aren't the exact same, but they somewhat parallel the three epidemics currently of liver disease in the United States. You heard last week about fatty liver disease, which absolutely is an epidemic. It's, as you heard, it's quite common. Um, hepatitis C also is quite an epidemic. We have great medications now available, but as you know, they're often quite expensive and we're um, trying to work to make them more affordable and to have insurances cover them so that we're able to cure patients with hepatitis C. We also have to work on um, screening patients for hepatitis C so that we um, know they have it so that they can get treated. 
Uh, so those two are quite common causes of liver disease, and then liver cancer also is, as we mentioned, quite a, what we call an epidemic in the United States. So you kind of heard a little bit about this, you know, the metabolic syndrome last, well, not a little, a lot actually, about the metabolic syndrome last week. So the metabolic syndrome refers to patients who have this constellation of obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. And that's the kind of the backbone for these patients to get fat in their liver, which we'll call steatosis. Now, we call this a pyramid because at the bottom of the pyramid, a large chunk of our country, about a third of the country, has fatty liver disease. So, it doesn't, so even if only about a fifth of those patients get inflammation in the liver, called steatohepatitis, itis meaning inflammation, that's still a quite a large percentage of the population who gets this steatohepatitis that we mentioned. And then a subset of those patients will get cirrhosis. And again, patients who have cirrhosis are at risk for liver cancer. And it's possible that even before you get to cirrhosis here, you're at risk for liver cancer. This is, uh, I put a question mark here because this is somewhat unclear and we're trying to figure it out. But by, we know this cascade exists, that metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, and if you develop cirrhosis, you're at risk for liver cancer, along with the other complications of fatty liver disease you heard about last week. Now, it's also important to know that um, these same uh, conditions that are associated with the metabolic syndrome are on their own risk factors for liver cancer. So what does that mean? So basically, patients who have diabetes, even, if, even in the absence of cirrhosis, for example, they have a threefold increased risk of liver cancer in the population. Patients with high cholesterol have an increased risk of liver cancer. Patients with high blood pressure and patients with obesity, these are all on their own, independent of cirrhosis, risk factors for liver cancer. And then you can see some of the other common causes that lead to uh, liver cancer, smoking. Obviously, we mentioned cirrhosis already. So these are all the kind of the, the yes, of course, these underlying causes of chronic liver disease. But we're seeing more and more patients who have these um, risk factors that we need to um, try to diagnose and, and try to manage. So how do we start to think about diagnosing liver cancer? Well, the first, time, first way is to start looking for it. Because often, if you don't look for it, it doesn't cause symptoms typically until it's very end stage. Um, often you might have heard of pancreatic cancer where um, it's often diagnosed very late because that's when it starts to cause symptoms. Same thing with liver cancer is that if you don't look for it, if you wait till a patient presents with quote unquote symptoms of liver cancer, which are very nonspecific but could include fatigue, weight loss, um, it could have spread um, to the brain and you know, there, so. Th but if you wait that long, then often it's too late and you're going to be limited with what your therapeutic options are. So really, with, when we know which populations are at risk, it makes sense to start screening for liver cancer. So that's the idea of screening or surveillance, is applying screening tests at regular intervals in patients at risk for liver cancer. So most societies recommend doing that with an ultrasound. Okay? An ultrasound is a way to basically image the liver well, you put a probe, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes and measures sound waves, and you can see the liver, and then any liver lesions that could pop up that might make you worried that that patient may have a liver cancer. I also mentioned here that some people often also use a blood test. It's called alpha feta protein or AFP, and you can kind of think of it similar to PSA, uh, which is a prostate um, test to look for prostate cancer. Alpha feta protein is somewhat similar. Um, so in some societies, they don't recommend this blood test, but all societies recommend ultrasounds every six months in patients at risk to look for cancer. Okay. So what's the evidence that doing the screening every six months is beneficial? It really comes from one study in Shanghai, China, of almost 20,000 people who had chronic hepatitis B. And what they did is they, ran, they took half of the patients and said, you guys get ultrasounds every six months. And they took the other half of patients and didn't do any screening. Not surprisingly, the patients who got surveillance had more diagnosis of liver cancer. That makes sense. If you're looking for it, you're going to find it. But really, the important part of this study is when you look at mortality, the mortality of the patients who got screening was much, much less, about 40% less, than patients who didn't get screening. Nowadays, because of this study, 
it's hard to, and this is only in hepatitis B, but it's really hard to do a study like this nowadays when screening is basically um, thought of as the right thing to do because it not, might not be ethical or fair to say, hey, let's take these half of the patients and not screen them. Um, and so now we basically accept, ex, uh, accept screening as the right thing to do for these patients. Okay, so let's think of a case here. So this is a 25-year-old Chinese woman who comes to our clinic with chronic hepatitis B infection of the liver and a biopsy didn't, that didn't really show anything too concerning. No scar, not a lot of inflammation. The patient doesn't have any symptoms, but her mom was diagnosed with liver cancer at age 55. That was cut out, resection. The patient's labs are normal. Their physical exam is normal. And we have to think, well, does this patient with hepatitis B need to be screened? And so thankfully, there's clear guidelines that come out for patients so that we know who, is and who isn't at risk for hepatitis B to get liver cancer. And in this case, the key point here is that this patient's mom had liver cancer, and so the patient is also at risk for liver cancer, at increased risk. Um, and so she is someone that we would start screening for liver cancer every six months, even though she's only 25 because we know her risk is higher. We know that if you, if we, that, that cancer that's diagnosed by screening is diagnosed at an earlier stage than patients who are not diagnosed by screening. So for our current guidelines, the patients who we think of screening with hepatitis B are patients, again with ultrasound, are patients who either have cirrhosis from their hepatitis B patients like I just mentioned who have a family history of liver cancer, or also, as I mentioned earlier, the older you are, the more likely you are to get liver cancer. And also, males are more likely to get liver cancer than females. So we try to use common sense and say, okay, who are the patients most at risk? They tend to be males with hepatitis B over 40, or females over 50, and so this is the group also that we would screen. And then finally, if they have a lot of inflammation in the liver because of the hepatitis B, we also screen those patients. So those are kind of the groups of patients with hepatitis B we screen. Now what about if you have cirrhosis? We basically recommend screening for all patients with cirrhosis, okay? Because those patients do appear to have at least a one to two, if not 3% or higher risk of getting liver cancer every year. Such that if someone is followed for 10 years with cirrhosis, they probably have around a 20, 30% risk of getting liver cancer. Now, you all have may have seen advertisements on TV for all the new hepatitis C therapies, um, maybe Harvoni, for example, or some of the other ones. It's really great that we can cure hepatitis C now, but sometimes we forget that just because we cure hepatitis C, the cirrhosis often doesn't go away. And so we, in patients who do have cirrhosis from the hepatitis C, we still have to keep screening them even after they've been cured of their virus, okay? Now, there's some good news, though, about, especially for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Okay, one important part is that with all the new hepatitis B therapies that are out there, not only do these treatments reduce the risk of having any complications of liver disease compared to placebo, but also these treatments, we used to use lamivudine for hepatitis B, now we use other medications. They also reduce the risk of getting liver cancer. So often in clinic, we start to think about giving people therapy, um, not just to, because, to prevent complications of liver disease, but also to prevent liver cancer. This is another interesting slide uh, that shows that the, higher, the more virus of hepatitis B you have in your blood, the more likely you are to get liver cancer over a 10 to 15 year period. So now we're starting to see the flavor of patients who get H liver cancer. It tends to, it's, again, it's patients with hepatitis B or cirrhosis, tends to be older males, and if they have hepatitis B, it's patients who have very high viral loads or they're older. One other very interesting thing about when we're thinking about viral causes of liver disease is, um, is that when we try to cure hepatitis C, nowadays you might hear, oh, it's easy to cure hepatitis C. We can eight weeks you get a 95, almost 100% chance to cure your virus, which sounds amazing. One issue for our patients with liver cancer, especially if patients have what's called active liver cancer, meaning that it hasn't been treated yet, is that 
There's been a lot of studies that show that the, the virus, the hepatitis E virus, can actually hide out in the liver cancer cells of the liver, such that you think, you're, that you think the, vi the hepatitis C medication's working, and so their virus levels goes to zero, but then when you stop the therapy, the virus comes back because it was hiding in those cancer cell reservoirs. So the way we know that is that they've been a, a, a meta-analysis or basically a collection of multiple studies addressing this topic. And basically what this shows here is that, um, that there's, instead of having almost 100% or 95% chance of curing hepatitis C, if you have cancer, you're actually down here at 73%. So patients who have liver cancer have a much lower rate of being successfully able to cure their virus. So that's another interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what it means is that when we talk to the community and say who has hepatitis C, we say we think we can cure your hepatitis C with near certainty, almost 95% or higher. Unfortunately, if you have liver cancer at the time of the liver cancer diagnosis, the chance of curing you is much lower because the hepatitis C particles are hanging out in those cancer cells, and then the hepatitis C comes roaring back after the treatment stops. So instead of being cured, the virus remains and then starts replicating again. So that's why you see a reduction in the chance of curing your liver can your hepatitis C, of course. Okay. So here's another patient. So this is a 55-year-old gentleman who has hepatitis C, and they have cirrhosis as well. We talked about doing an ultrasound every six months for that patient, and on one of their ultrasounds, they find a lesion in the liver. It's about three centimeters, which is just over one inch. Now, what we do next in that scenario is we need better imaging to get better sense of what the, of what the lesion actually is, because the imaging can say, okay, this is a cancer, or no, this looks like nothing at all, it was a fake out. So we do something, we do a CT scan, and it confirms the presence of a, about an inch or 2.5 centimeter lesion. And you guys heard about the right and left lobe earlier in this course as well, um, the two lobes of the liver. The patient has no symptoms. Um, and you see labs of the patient. And basically what they show here is the bilirubin level is elevated. A typical bilirubin level is one that usually reflects normal liver function. In this case, your bilirubin level is slightly high, as well as your clotting time is also slightly high. That means the liver isn't functioning completely normally. Okay? Also, the patient has a slightly low platelet count. And you may have heard about that earlier in the, this course, but basically when the liver is not working well, the blood that's supposed to be going into the liver and getting filtered can't get through it well because of the cirrhosis, because of the scarring, and starts backing up. And one of the places the blood goes to is the spleen. And that causes the spleen to get really big. And so, you, and so a lot of our patients with cirrhosis have big spleens. And the spleen starts gobbling up platelets. So sometimes the first sign of, well actually, uh, because every, a lot of people get blood counts done. So sometimes one of the first signs of chronic liver disease is a low platelet count. Um, so we have to wonder, you know, on this CT scan, can we diagnose whether the patient has a liver cancer or not? So our radiologists now are trained to look for specific features on the CT scan or MRI that'll tell us pretty well whether the lesion is or is not a liver cancer. So some of the buzzwords we talk about, I'm just you can read them here, but um, we're gonna go through these, what they mean, but on something called the arterial phase, the lesion looks bright. And then later on, it looks dark or is known to wash out. I'm going to show you pictures and explain these. It may have a capsule around the edge, or it may be growing. And I'm, it probably makes sense that lesions that are growing are more likely to be cancer. Also, we, we have different diagnostic criteria depending on the size, because the bigger the lesion, the more likely it is to be liver cancer. Okay. So when we think about the blood supply of the liver and when we're giving contrast through the veins for the CT or MRI, it's important to, it's important to know that there's two ways that blood gets to the liver. There's something called the portal vein, which supplies around two-thirds of the blood. And then there's something called the hepatic artery, which supplies about one-third of the blood. Now, we can take this into account to help us really figure out the normal imaging criteria of a liver cancer. 
because the liver cancer is typically fed by the artery, whereas the rest of the liver is typically fed by the portal vein. So this right here is contrast in the aorta, which is the main vessel that leaves the heart and brings blood to the rest of the body. So this is showing us that we've injected contrast into the aorta, or into the vein, into the vein and now it's gotten into the aorta. And then our liver cancer looks bright compared to the rest of the liver because this cancer is getting its blood supply from the artery from the aorta versus the rest of the liver still hasn't got its venous blood yet. This is somewhat of a complex topic, but basically we're taking advantage of the blood supply pathway to learn about whether this is or is not a, a liver cancer. Now, later on, when the aorta is no longer bright, we know now the liver is getting its blood supply from the portal vein, but the cancer is no longer getting its blood supply from the artery. So now it looks dark. So again, we're able to take advantage of these different blood supplies that are coming into the liver and the cancer. And so these are kind of classic features that tell us that yes, this looks like a liver cancer. Um, we actually have a staging system now based in part on the size and these other features. And so anytime we order a CT or MRI, the radiologist will say for any lesion that we see, is it definitely benign or not cancerous? Is it probably benign? Is it indeterminate? Is it probably cancer or is it definitely cancer? Okay, so what's interesting actually is that we can uh, typically diagnose liver cancer without a biopsy, which is kind of wild because I can think of very, very, very few cancers out there that you don't need a biopsy for. And sometimes this throws patients for a loop a little bit where they say, wait, how do you, I feel fine. How do you, well, how do you know I have liver cancer? You haven't, you haven't done a biopsy. So it can be a very confusing and stressful period of time, especially when, the, when a patient um, has not had a tissue sampling. But because if we have a patient who's at risk for cancer, who has the right imaging findings, we can actually make a diagnosis of liver cancer without a biopsy. What this basically shows is that we're pretty good at that. Remember, I just showed you these features where, for example, a lot, uh, something called a LIRADS-5, we call a definite liver cancer. Now, studies have shown that we're pretty good. 19, 19 times out of 20, we were right when we said that was a, a definite liver cancer. And 49 times out of 50, we we're right that it's a malignant or a cancerous lesion in the liver. Versus if it, we called it an intermediate based on its imaging features, it's much less likely to be cancer, but we still have to follow it because it could turn into a cancer. Now, again, is biopsy necessary? We already started to touch on this but it's actually not necessary, which is kind of wild, if it meets the right criteria on imaging in the appropriate clinical setting, meaning that the patient's at risk for liver cancer and the lesion looks like a liver cancer. Also, there's some risks of biopsies. And if you do a biopsy on a relatively small lesion and you miss it, you might falsely reassure a patient that they don't have liver cancer when in fact they do. Um, so we, we, there are certain circumstances where we do biopsy, but I would say most of our patients with liver cancer have not been biopsied. Now, the other thing that uh, Sharif mentioned at the, begin at the top of this talk was uh, the idea of a multidisciplinary tumor board. Multidisciplinary meaning that we have multiple different types of specialists come in and get together to go over patients' imaging studies. So who comes? We do this every Tuesday and Thursday from 4.30 to 6 um, here. We use Zoom teleconferencing so that patients at different sites, including Mission Bay campus, can participate as well. As you might know, UCSF has a lot of different campuses, and so it's hard to get everyone to our campus, and so we nicely have the images um, available. And we also have started to do virtual tumor boards, where we can now um, use Zoom or teleconferencing um, so that we can do a tumor board with, pay, uh, with providers. And so, for example, right now we do it with San Jose, a group in Stockton, and a group in Fresno. So we're able to reach out to the community to give them liver support uh, because there's not a hell lot of hepatologists outside uh, in the Bay Area outside of CPMC, Stanford, and UCSF. So who participates? Liver, doc liver doctors, hepatologists, liver surgeons. You met some of those already. Dr. Syed, who, you met, who you've known. Uh, Dr. Roberts, I believe, gave a talk with you. Interventional radiologists. This is a group of doctors who are trained um, in radiology, and then they have to do interventions. So um, they can do therapies, they can treat the liver cancer. Uh, they also do other things outside the liver. They're often, they, if, um, for patients who need to go on dialysis emergently or need lines for antibiotics, they do those. 
Um, they can do procedures through the neck, through the groin, et cetera. Radiologists, the doctors who read the imaging are there. Oncologists are the cancer specialists, though I will say that um, unlike most cancers, um, instead of oncologists being the gateway or the main providers, often it's the hepatologist or the liver doctor. That's why I'm giving this talk rather than an oncologist because oncology certainly does play a role, and we'll get to that at the very end, but a lot of these patients don't need an oncologist. They don't actually, um, there's other therapies that they can uh, benefit from uh, besides necessarily something like chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And then we also have radiation oncologists there. These are patients who, these are uh, providers who uh, can do external radiation to the cancer. The goal is to confirm the diagnosis, to stage it, and to determine the treatment strategies. Um, so, you know, the first treatment strategy that we like to think about um, is cutting it out or resection. So that's kind of thought to be the gold standard. So if you diagnose someone with a liver cancer, often the first thing we think about is, can we cut it out? Um, that's kind of what we would think about with most cancers, right? If you have breast cancer, the first thing you often think about is, hey, is this curative? Can I cut it out? Same thing with uh, liver cancer. Now, there's a couple caveats here. First, obviously, is that if you can't cut the whole thing out, probably you shouldn't do that. Do it. That's true of all cancers, right? or most cancers. But there's a few other caveats here as well. This, the first caveat that I'd mention is that most of these patients have chronic liver disease and often cirrhosis. And if you cut out, if a liver has cirrhosis and you cut out part of it, as you heard early in the first few weeks of this session, you kind of, your liver, the cirrhotic liver often isn't working well. So if you cut out part of it, you could go into liver failure. So you really have to think twice if you're a surgeon about how much liver am I going to be cutting out? How much liver will the pa patient have left? Will they be able to survive with that amount of liver left? If the patient doesn't have cirrhosis, which is co quite common with hepatitis B, where uh, in Asia, often that patient can get cut out. But in the West, only 5% of our patients actually can, um, are able to, be get, to able to get kind of resection, maybe 5 to 10%. The rest of them, in terms of surgical treatments, it's too dangerous or too challenging to do, to do resection or cutting out the tumor. So instead, we start to think about liver transplant. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, if we, we separate patients with cirrhosis into something called child pew A, B, and C, where a, a child pew A patient is someone who is walking around and may not even know they have cirrhosis. They have no symptoms. They have good liver function. So, you know, they might be a patient who has hepatitis C for the last 30 years and got cirrhosis, but they never had symptoms, and so they are, um, and so we call, we say that they have good liver function. Now, there is a chance that you might be able to resect that patient if you don't have to take off too much of their liver. If they have impaired liver function, if they have symptoms of their liver disease, like bleed, some of the things you've heard earlier about, but bleeding or fluid retention or confusion, if they have symptoms with their whole liver, you can imagine they're going to have really bad symptoms with only part of their liver. So those are patients we do not cut out. Okay, those are patients we might think about a liver transplant. So who's the ideal candidate to get a resection or having it cut out? Again, good liver function. We want to make sure that they have relatively limited, uh, so we talked earlier about the high pressures in the liver. If you have very high pressures in the liver, you're not going to do well also with resection. You might get really sick. We mentioned the bilirubin, we want that to be normal uh, because if patients have in high bilirubin, they often will, get, will go into liver failure with resection. We don't want the tumor to be too, too big if possible because the bigger it is, the more likely it is to come back uh, again even after you cut it out. And then finally, we learned a little bit about the relative sizes of the lobes of the liver in the last few weeks, but the left lobe is smaller. And so if, you, if the lesion's in the left lobe and you just have to cut out part of the left lobe, you can actually often keep maybe 80% of the liver and the patient may do okay. So we think these are the things we think about when deciding if a patient can or can't get the liver cancer cut out. Now, unfortunately, one of the reasons that limits the utility of resection or cutting it out is that cancer often comes back in the remaining liver. And there's a lot of predictors of why it could come back, but almost 70% or two-thirds of patients, you cut it out, you hope they're cured, but two-thirds of them, it comes back. So that does limit um, uh, how the effectiveness of resection. So that's why we think about transplant, and that's why, you know, that's, um, you know, that's one of the main 
parts of this talk is kind of why organs fail and, and how to replace them. So surprisingly, liver cancer is a pretty common indication for transplant, okay? Now, in the United States, we use something called the Milan criteria, which is a basically a function of how big the tumors are, how many there are, and you wanna make sure the tumor hasn't spread outside the liver, because if it does, you can imagine a transplant's not gonna cure you. If you have liver cancer in the liver, but it's in the lungs as well, you can transplant all you want, but you're, it's not gonna do anything about this the spot that's in the lung, and so the, the cancer will progress. So when we do a transplant, our goal is for cure, right? This is a, you've heard all the last five weeks, transplants, a, it's a big operation. It's technically very challenging. Patients can get very sick and have a bad complication. So if we're gonna do it, we, this, we're doing it to cure the cancer, okay? So these are the criteria that we use. Um, and if we use these criteria, five years after transplant, only about a 10, out of, 10 to 15 percent of patients will have the cancer come back. And five-year survival after the transplant is actually really good. So around four out of every five patients who get a transplant for liver cancer are still alive five years. Um, and about 60 to 65 percent of patients are alive 10 years after the transplant if they have cancer, if for cancer. So we do see some pretty good long-term outcomes. Um, so uh, how do we approach transplant for liver cancer? Well, so there's, you know, we have a lot of policies, as you might imagine. One thing that's recently been introduced is that we used to have a, it's hard to put patients with and without liver cancer on the same list because they have on the same wait list for transplant because they, they look very different. Patients who have bad cirrhosis could be admitted to the hospital. They can be very sick. They can be intensive care unit. They could be bleeding or confused, et cetera. They could be on dialysis. How do you put that patient on the same list as someone who's at home feeling pretty good but has liver cancer? It's very hard to do that. For many years, we tried and we, were giving, we figured out we were giving way too much priority to the cancer patients. So now we, so we make them wait six months because there's some data that if you do that, you can better equalize the rates of transplant between those two different groups, the cancer and the non-cancer patients who are both waiting for organs. So that's one thing we've done as a country. The other challenging part is that there's regional variation okay, in access to transplants. So here in California, we have huge organ shortages, whereas in other parts of the country like the southeast or other places, um, they have much higher access to liver transplant. Now there's a lot of reasons for that, but some of those involve motorcycle law laws, uh, helmet laws, gun laws, rates of stroke, other causes of donor death, unfortunately. And so there's regional variations that exist that might increase or decrease the supply and, and, and also the demand uh, changes as well. And so this is a, you know, this is a very technical um, slide, but what I, in terms of walking you through it, um, on the left you see the rates of dropout. That means a patient with liver cancer not making it to transplant. What are those, you know? And what we do is we plotted this by different parts of the country. And we're here in a, what's called a long wait time region. We have much higher rates of dropout or someone who's listed for transplant with cancer, but they can't actually make it to the top of the list because of how long the wait is. Versus you can see there's certain parts of the country where 90% of people make it a transplant, we're only 70%. This doesn't really seem fair. Um, and so what we've done is we've actually tried to equalize rates or access to transplant for liver cancer throughout the, um, throughout the country by changing the number of points they get, the MELD score that they get. So that's something that we just did a few months ago. So now, for example, after you wait those six months, here in California, you'll get 29 points versus if you went to Jacksonville, you might get 23 points. Why is that important? Well, in the past, people might fly from here to Jacksonville to get a transplant sooner with their cancer. We've, we've, we, the whole purpose of this is to try to, to get rid of that incentive to travel or that, that, um, that the change in likelihood of transplant based on where you live um, if you have liver cancer. Now, one other thing that we've noticed is that you can use some of the uh, blood tests to figure out how a patient's going to do after transplant. Okay, so it's not just about how much tumor you have, but also what are your blood tests? And this is the, the AFP, that tumor marker we mentioned earlier. So this is showing that if you have a very, very high tumor marker, you don't do very well after transplant. So we've also enacted policy here in this country that if you have a very, very high tumor marker, 
you're at risk for a bad outcome with transplant. So you have to get that number down with treatments before you're eligible to undergo transplant. So we're gonna get to that. Um, it's called, LRT stands for local regional treatment. So those are the treatments I'm gonna to mention to try to treat the cancer in different ways besides surgery. So here's, an, and this is what we're about to get to. So here's a patient. You can see their liver here. I'm gonna outline it. This is their heart and the vessel that's supplying the blood from the liver into the, um, the heart, the right side of the heart. And you can see a lot of the liver looks okay, but here, and in this circle, these are both two spots of liver cancer. Hopefully you can appreciate how this looks different than the rest of the liver. Now, if this patient comes to you, we have to figure out how to treat this patient. And if I told you that this patient's lesions are too big to get to transplant, the country, the po national policy says you have too much tumor, you cannot currently undergo liver transplant. What we need to do then is to try to shrink this patient's tumor down to get it into criteria, okay? So we call this process downstaging, where you take a patient who has a lot of tumor and you treat it, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how you treat it, so you can shrink it and get it into acceptable criteria, and then they can undergo transplant and hopefully be cured. So this is defined as a reduction in the size of the tumor using LRT or local regional treatments I'm about to mention to meet acceptable criteria, okay? So this is an example of that where you have on the left, you have a patient with a large tumor in the top of their liver. You, you treat it usually with those interventional radiologists that I mentioned, okay, doing the treatments. And then you can start to see that now after one treatment, a lot of it looks dead, but some of it still looks bright and alive. And then you treat it again and now the whole thing looks dead. So this is basically the idea behind downstaging or taking a bigger tumor and baking, basically shrinking it and, kill, and killing it. Well, so how do we do that? What are those local regional therapies? What are those LRTs? Well, there's a whole host of them actually, and we're not gonna be able to get too much into each of them, but these are the different treatments we can offer patients. We can, um, like I mentioned, a lot of these done are done by interventional radiologists. So to walk you through a few of them, there's something called chemo embolization, and there's something called radio embolization. This is where an interventional radiologist will have a patient, they'll go through the art, they'll get into the uh, art main artery in the groin, it's called a femoral artery. They'll then walk, snake up, basically up, 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 through the aorta, and then get into the hepatic artery or, and find the artery that's supplying the cancer, okay? It basically looks like this in the interventional radiology where their catheter is here, they inject contrast into the liver, and you see the whole blood supply of the liver come into view, and you can see over here there's a blush. Now the interventional radiologist says, aha, and this is the tumor. And so now you can imagine they get their wire up here, and they inject chemotherapy directly into the tumor. So it's pretty cool that they can do this. So they're basically selectively embolizing the, the artery and then injecting different toxins or chemotherapies to try to kill the tumor. Patients, as you can imagine, could get sick from this, you know, depending on, uh, hopefully they don't have complications, but it can lead to fevers, pain, infection. But for the most part, patients tolerate this very well. Now, if you were to do the exact same thing, but instead of injecting chemotherapy directly into the tumor, you injected radiation into the tumor, this is something called radio or radiation embolization. And the type of radiation we use is yttrium or Y90. So if you remember way back to your periodic table, down there somewhere is yttrium 90 or Y90 is a radioactive um, element that can actually kill the tumor as well. And the response rates are really, really good. Now there's been only one study that's compared those two types of treatments directly. And maybe they suggest that the Y90 or the radiation does better than the chemo embolization in terms of time to tumor progression, meaning how long does it take the tumor to start getting bigger or to start spreading? So maybe, the rate, maybe it takes longer for the way, why 90 maybe we should be doing this more and more. Unfortunately, the overall survival of those two groups is the same, and so we don't yet have enough data to suggest using one or the other, though um, you know, the field is kind of shifting to try to figure out what's the right ways to treat these tumors, but as you can tell, we have a lot of good options. Now, so I mentioned this patient earlier. 
And so they have, this is the patient we showed earlier with two big tumors here. Now we, we decide to treat this patient with the internal radiation, okay, that radioembolization. Now you can see we have the similar picture that's, that's gotten by the interventional radiologist. So this is under fluoroscopy. Again, you can see them going into the hepatic artery. And you can see that there's a big blush all the way here. And then you can faintly make it out here as well that corresponds to these two blushes, okay? So that's where they're gonna inject their, chemo, or their radiation. And so how does that look? Well, after they do the first treatment, it's a little hard to appreciate, but you can start to see dark, dark spots here. And this is areas where it seems like the radiation has uptaked and now is killing off the tumor, where this area still looks to be quite alive. Same thing down here, it does look darker, suggesting death of the tumor cells. And then what if we do a second treatment a few months later, now you can see there's a really nice treatment effect. If you compare this to this, you can see that this looks darker. And even though it's a really big tumor, we appear to have a good radiation effect of the tumors. So this is, we think, a, a good response to treatment. We think that these patients who get these treatments are going to live longer, and there's data to suggest that these treatments actually help them live longer with their liver cancer. Now, what are some other treatments? Well, you can, something called ablation, which is where you burn the tumor. You can use different types of current. You can do radio frequency, microwave, a type of heat. You can do something called cryoablation, which is co using cold to, bur to burn the tumor, very cold. Um, and we really, you can imagine that if you're trying to go in to, to do this, you have to find a, you want to make sure you have the right location of the tumor so that you're not burning or freezing areas that shouldn't be burned or frozen, right? So this part, this lesion right here that's, that looks like a good spot to burn it, however, because it's not close to anything. But this lesion, for example, is very close to the diaphragm, the area that, sub, that separates the abdomen or the belly from the chest. So if you try to burn this tumor, if you get too close to the diaphragm, you're gonna burn the diaphragm, that could be trouble. Or what about here, where you have a tumor that's right up against the bowel? Well, if you try to burn this tumor, you might burn the bowel as well, and that's not good. So location is certainly a limitation of ablation. And the other interesting thing about this is when you try to ab ablate a tumor, well, if there's a vessel coursing right next to it, that vessel could function as a heat sink where all that heat or uh, current that you apply to the tumor actually just goes right into the vessel and goes away. And so there's a lot of interesting ideas about the ablation in terms of the locations, but it can be done either by the same interventional radiologist that I mentioned, just by going through the, the side, or it actually can be done in the operating room by a surgeon who does it laparoscopically and can find the tumor with ultrasound and then burn it. Now the last thing I wanted to mention uh, in the last few minutes that we have before questions is something called targeted therapy for liver cancer. And we kind of think of this as the dawn of a new era. So I mentioned earlier that really liver, uh, liver cancer is mostly in the arms of the hepatologists and the surgeons at first, and the interventional radiologists. All the treatments I've met mentioned so far typically are decided on tumor board by the whole team, but the gatekeepers are the hepatologists or the liver doctors. But once a patient gets more advanced disease, now they're no longer candidates for cutting it out resection or transplant. Once the tumor has either, is too advanced, has spread outside the liver, for example, now we need more systemic therapy, therapy that's gonna go into the whole body rather than just targeted therapy to a lesion in the liver, okay? So, you know, there's a whole host of different t types of therapy that have been studied for liver cancer that mostly looking at something, uh, interacting with something called a tyrosine kinase receptor. This is. Um, one of the receptors that the chemotherapy is trying to act on. And basically, what we've learned over all these years is we've had a, in the, we, for 10 years, we only had one chemotherapy that was approved for liver cancer. <laughs> this is therapy is called serafinib. And it was for patients who had child's A or basically no symptoms of their cirrhosis, but they had very advanced cancer including half of them who already had spread of their cancer outside the liver or had gone into the big vessels of the liver. So they were randomized to either get the chemo or, the, or placebo. And what they found is that on average, patients live three months longer with serafinib. For a transplant doctor, three months is not good. It's, that's not what we're hoping for. But in, in the oncology world, sur increased survival is still increased survival, 
And it was the only chemotherapy that had ever been shown to be uh, effective, and so it was FDA approved. And remember that survival is, this is for everybody. An individual patient much ha may have a much better response than just three months. So it has been approved, and for 10 years, it was the only treatment that was available, systemic treatment that was available for liver cancer. Fortunately, in the last one to two years, we've had an explosion with six, no less than six more systemic therapies approved, including a different kind of chemotherapy that acts very similar called linvatinib. It was, it was in, a, in a big study, it was found to be not worse than serafinib, okay? And the, the rate of people stopping the linvatinib was the same as serafinib. Um, and so actually in the last year, it was approved as chemotherapy in the United States, Europe, and Japan. So now, if we have a patient who has advanced cancer, but a good performance status and doesn't have a lot of symptoms of their liver disease, we have two first-line chemotherapy agents that we can offer for patients to help them live longer, knowing that these won't be curing them. These are really only trying to extend life. When we think of cure, we're really limited to transplant and resection. Now, what if you try one of these or both and the patient progresses or they don't tolerate this chemotherapy? Well, all five of these drugs have been approved in the last year to, uh, as second line therapy options. So you try one or both of the first lines and for whatever reason the oncologist says, well, that didn't work, what's next? We have two more of the similar types of medications, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. One is called regorafenib, one is called cabozantinib. Okay, these are second line agents. And then interestingly and importantly, there's now immunotherapy, which has been approved as second line therapy for liver cancer. So immunotherapy, and you may have seen some uh, commercials for this, but is this new way of treating cancer that instead of using chemotherapy or kind of these caustic chemicals, immunotherapy is basically chaining the body to, to recognize the tumor cells as foreign in training, the, in training the body to attack the tumor cells on their own. Because the cancer cells are very smart. They know how to escape detection. They put up all these blockers, these signals that say, okay, you, you're, the host can't recognize me. And then it starts, then the tumor starts replicating and then it's too late and the body, the body doesn't know that they're there. What the immunotherapy does is it basically turns that mechanism off and allows the body to recognize the cancer cells as foreign. So this is a very exciting line of therapy. One, because it's not chemotherapy, so hopefully it has a better side effect profile. And two is it can work for a lot of different cancer types. So the two immunotherapies that have been approved are nivolumab and something called pembrolizumab. There's also one other agent that's been approved. Now, the, that's all exciting. But really the most exciting for this field is now starting to try to combine agents from different pathways, maybe putting uh, serafinib with an immunotherapy together and see if we can really start to extend life quite a bit. But currently the targeted therapy, the pathway for liver cancer is in a patient who has advanced cancer, a, for example, spreading outside the liver, we have two first line agents and five second line agents and with this, we can now get patients who used to be living only about six to nine months. On average, we can now extend them uh, their life to around, on average, two years. So not perfect by any stretch, but certainly progress, and we hope to continue on that progress. But in general, earlier stage cancers can be cured with resection sometimes, but really the goal is transplant for those patients to have a really nice cure with about 90% having a cure rate with liver transplantation. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about liver cancer, but I'd love to take any uh, questions that you have. Yeah, so the two questions, the first one will, uh, maybe I'll do the CRISPR question first. Um, certainly CRISPR is, um, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, is basically this idea of gene editing uh, technology. And while it's exciting for a lot of fields and may revolutionize cancer therapy or therapy for a lot of things, um, is, no, is not really ready for, people really aren't even studying it yet for liver cancer, though down the road they may start. But we don't, I don't have any good data to tell you yet whether CRISPR potentially could be helpful for liver cancer. For your first question, um, yes, the liver absolutely regenerates. The problem is that most patients who get liver cancer have cirrhosis. 
and the cirrhotic liver typically doesn't regenerate, or if it does, nowhere near to the extent that the liver that's healthy regenerates. So that's why if you cut out part of the liver that has cirrhosis, it typically doesn't grow back, and so you do run the risk of liver failure if you cut out too much liver. Yeah, so that's a good question. So I showed this picture earlier, um, for example here, where this is all dead tumor. Thankfully, for the most part, we don't see a lot of infections or back, this doesn't seem to be a nidus or a host for bacteria or viruses or parasite to come in. These aren't abscesses in the, uh, uh, they're very different. They're just dead kind of, and they could look like that for years and years, or even better would be these areas start to shrink over time. So but we haven't really, we don't really see uh, bacteria coming in, for example, and, and taking up shop in these dead uh, areas because it's not hepatocytes that are dead. It's not functioning liver tumors, liver cells that are dead. It's the cancer cells that are dead. Yes, so the question is whether with transplant, are you, tr are you starting over with a clean slate? And absolutely. Um, the, the new liver um, shouldn't have any chronic liver disease and therefore is an extremely low risk to get liver cancer. The reason why people get liver cancer is not anything related to the new liver. It's usually related to circulating tumor cells at the time of transplant that then hang out and then go into the new liver or go to the lungs or go somewhere else. So actually, after transplant, for patients who do have the cancer come back, it's quite common for that to come back in areas outside the liver, like the lungs, the adrenal gland, the brain, the bones, et cetera. And you can imagine that doesn't have a good prognosis. But we really try to do our best to select patients appropriately as best as we can to try to minimize the risk of people picking patients who go through a big liver transplant and then six months or a year later, we find the cancer back again. So for the most part, yes, we're starting over with the clean slate. Yeah, so the question basically is, I mentioned killing the cancer, but I said it's not really curative. And you're exactly right that these often are a bridge to transplant, for example, because they're likely, almost certainly, there's almost no way, especially in a tumor this big, that we were able to kill every single tumor cell and so especially the larger tumors, there is a pretty high chance, if not 90, you know, very high chance that it's going to come back at some point. So that's why we think of these as a bridge to liver transplant, for example, or a way to help someone live longer. But the chemotherapy and the radiation typically aren't thought to be curative, though we have seen patients who get one or more of these treatments and do have a five plus year survival. So in rare cases, we do see long-term survival. But for the most patients, we, we treat them and then we try to get them on the list for transplant and eventually they get to the top of the list, they get a transplant and hopefully they don't recur. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is about where organs come from because of, so they're basically wondering uh, in terms of how we change the policy. So I should uh, uh, be clear that we only change the policy for cancer patients. So right now, patients without cancer are likely still more likely to get a liver in certain parts of the country than in California. But for liver cancer, since we're giving them extra points um, for their liver cancer, we, there's no reason we have to give the same amount of points here as somewhere else. So we do unequal points to make it balanced. Now, in terms of where organs come from, we really try to get organs, well, the surgeons do, from first local. So for example, in, um, you know, for how a liver may get accession. So say a liver becomes available in our area. So what we have is we have an organ procurement organization or an OPO. And their job, ours is, is CTDN, the California Donor Network. And their job is to basically uh, basically to get organs to, you know, we have take this terrible time where someone's passing away by a brain death or a heart death and basically talk with family and, and see if we can convert these patients into donors. Now, if you are, that OPO's job is to find the, the transplant to go through the list of the, um, in their donor service area, their DSA. So what that means is that the, org, the OPO is, is basically trying to find hospitals in, nearby that are doing transplants and figure out what the list looks like. So our DSA, for example, includes CPMC, Stanford, and UCSF. So we all have our own lists, and they're all put onto one list, and that's usually where our livers come from. Now, there are some differences in terms of sometimes we might get a liver from further away if we have sicker patients. So there is regional sharing, and there's also something called national sharing, where every once in a while we get a liver from very far away. 
But for the most part, our livers come from um, our kind of Northern California area. If it, so the question is that the cancer did not originate in the liver. And so um, I think what you're getting at is maybe a cancer that spread to the liver. So actually, surprisingly, you can in very rare circumstances. So we said this talk was about liver cancer, primarily HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma. There are a couple types of cancers that can commonly spread to the liver that patient, people in this world, not necessarily this country, but in the world have started to do liver transplants for. The two most common ones, and they're still not that common, but are colorectal cancer and something called neuroendocrine tumors. So neuroendocrine tumors typically are, it's a little tricky to get into, um, but basically it's a specific cell type that can become cancerous. And often that's a cancer either in the GI tract or in the pancreas, and it commonly spreads to the liver. The liver is a very common site of metastasis. You guys know Steve Jobs? Mm -hmm. Well, did. So Steve Jobs actually had a neuroendocrine tumor that spread to the liver, and he went to Tennessee and got a liver transplant. Uh, didn't end up working, he ended up dying. But, um, but there are other types of cancers that you can do liver transplant for. For that neuroendocrine, you have to cut out the main site, the original site. So say it's in the pancreas, you have to cut out part of the pancreas, get rid of that. Oh, or if it's in the small bowel or wherever it is, you have to cut that out. And then you also do the liver transplant to try to cure a patient. Same thing with colorectal cancer. Uh, there's certain criteria. It's not very common treatment at all. So you know, millions and millions of cases of colorectal cancer a year, there's only been a handful of patients who've gotten a liver transplant. But if you were to do it, you'd have to have the right patient. You'd have to have a patient who has, has their main colon cancer cut out. And basically, their only side of disease has, is the spread of the cancer into the liver. And then in that very, that in that case, in circ rare circumstances, you can consider a transplant. But by and large, metastatic disease to the liver is, is not a reason to do a liver transplant. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question is, well, what if the patient, uh, the drinking wasn't the cause, what if they had a genetic cause of their liver disease? Can they, I assume you're wondering, can they drink? And, and so every center is somewhat different on this. I think our center tends to be a little strict. We encourage them not to drink no matter what the cause of their liver disease is. But, you know, if someone, um, if someone is like, a, what have you heard? Yeah, so if someone has an autoimmune hepatitis, for example, where the, or some other disease where they, they didn't do anything, quote unquote, wrong, they just got cirrhosis and need a liver, yes, probably a drink, you know, a couple of drinks a week probably is not going to hurt the new liver, though we still ask them not to do it. Again, because it's hard to say, well, you can drink a little bit, but not a lot. Like, it's, you know, those conversations are hard, and, but some centers actually are probably okay with that. So it's, it's you know, there's no firm rules uh, to guide us in that case. So the question's about acetaminophen or Tylenol. Um, someone with a normal liver is allowed to have four grams of Tylenol a day. Someone with a injured or damaged or cirrhotic liver or someone who has chronic liver disease can have two grams of Tylenol per day. Um, and it might actually be the safest pain medicine out there for them um, because of the harms of opiates and other pain medications, potential adverse effects. So our patients before transplant who get, um, who have pain, we encourage them to take up to 2,000 milligrams of Tylenol per day. After transplant, probably that's also around the, uh, probably the, the threshold. They probably shouldn't take much more than that. All right, well, thank you all very much. This was a pleasure for me, and I hope you enjoyed it.